We're so happy to be here today with you all, and I am Wendy Manus. This is my husband, Jonathan Manus, and we're going to worship with a song called Survivor. For so long I carried the weight of my past, crippled by burdens like stones on my back. I thought I had fallen too far from your grace, but you came and showed me the way. When I was a lost soul searching, you were the ground beneath my feet. When I was a blind man begging, you were the eyes so I could see. When the smoke was rising up, you were the air that I could breathe. You gave me hope, you gave me something to believe. Now I I'm Charles Maynard, one of the pastors here at Cokesbury, Knoxville. Welcome to worship. I'm glad that you're a part of this service today. We come, we've come to a different setting to tell you about some other types of things in this series that we've had with the mountains and valleys of our lives. And I want us to talk about that, the, the valleys that we all have lived in. Now, I don't know if you know me or not, but I enjoy hiking. I enjoy hiking in the mountains in particular. Uh, it's just wonderful to walk up to the top of Mount Leconte or, or Clingman's Dome, Gregory Bald, Spence Field, Rocky Top, all peaks in the Smokies. And, and I've had wonderful moments on the top of mountains where you've got great views looking out all over the place. But you know, when you think about it, a hike to the mountains, the mountaintop is really only a small part of the hike. It's just a fraction of the experience of the whole day. I once walked to the summit of Mount Whitney, 
It's in California. It's the highest peak in the lower 48. We began that walk of 22 miles in that day at 3.30 in the morning. It was dark. And we walked all day, all the way to the top. We spent about 30 minutes on the top and then walked all the way down. 14 hour experience, but only 30 minutes was on the peak, was at the top. And it was incredible. The whole trip was incredible, not just that 30 minutes at the top. We have mountaintop moments in our lives, but really we spend most of our time in the valley on our life's journeys. You see, the valley is where we live. It's where we discover who we are. It's where we discover who God is. You see, today in this series, we've been talking about the different valleys. Today, we're gonna to talk about the valley of opposition. As I think about the opposition that we experience in our own lives, within our lives, the conflict that we have in ourselves, I think about a time when the Israelites had come up out of Egypt. They trekked through the wilderness for 40 years and they crossed the Jordan into the land that God promised them. And even after they crossed the river, they had to conquer it. The land wasn't just handed to them. And as they were doing this, the Gibeonites, a group of people that were in that area that the Israelites were trying to conquer, came to Joshua and, and the leaders of the Israelites and they tricked Joshua into believing that they were from far, far away and that they wanted to be their friends and allies. But, the, but the, the passage I want you to hear is this one line out of the book of Joshua where in this story it says, so the leaders partook of their provisions and did not ask direction from the Lord. Now, do you, do you hear that? They didn't ask God for directions. They didn't consult with God. And so, as you can probably guess, things don't go well after that. Now think about it in our own lives, at least in my life. Sometimes we say, hey, it's okay, God, I got this. I, I don't really need your help. Uh, I, I can do this on my own. Uh, I won't bother you with this one this time. I'm not gonna check in with you. I, I'll just handle this one. But. God uh, doesn't make us do any things. God doesn't make us do certain things. God loves us so much that God will not force us. God will let us choose, make our own choices. And so consequently, God says, ah, okay, then you can have it on your own. But after uh, this moment that I'm talking about, when Joshua doesn't seek God's counsel, I wonder if Joshua thought about the time that Moses was turning the leadership of the people over to him. The Israelites could see the promised land from where they were. They weren't there yet, but they could see it. They were actually up in the mountains and they could see the promised land in the distance. And Moses got all the folks together for his farewell speech. And this is what he said. Surely this commandment that I'm commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It's not in heaven that you would say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It's in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in God's ways and observing God's commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today 
that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live loving the Lord your God, obeying God, and holding fast to the Lord. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Maybe Joshua just got too busy. Maybe he began to think uh, that he was handling these things pretty well. He could do it all on his own. You see, when we withdraw, when we rely only on ourselves, that very act cuts ourselves off from God, the source of life. Hey everybody, welcome to Cokesbury Church. My name is Stephen, I'm the senior pastor here. 
Today is a huge day in the life of our church. We've got a great event going on tonight, 6 p.m. out in the parking lot. We're gonna have worship, and so there'll be live music, there'll be preaching. We're even gonna share communion with one another. So I wanna encourage you, bring a lawn chair, bring some friends. We're gonna ask you to socially distance from each other, but it's a great opportunity for us to get together and celebrate. So that's tonight, North Campus, 6 p.m. I wanna say thank you guys for your generosity, especially those of you that give up to Cokesbury Church on a regular basis. You guys over the past couple of months have not just helped keep the lights on or keep the staff paid, although we deeply appreciate that. You guys, through your generosity, have actually helped us do astounding ministry. We're starting in-person events now. Recovery's back, um, Fig Tree is starting to open. Uh, we've served people who are in need. We've collected things. We've had small groups do things together. We've even had adult baptisms. We've had funerals. The ministry of Cokesbury Church has been unbelievable during this pandemic, and it's because of you guys. And so I just want you to know from the bottom of my heart how much we appreciate what you're doing in taking your next step in helping support Cokesbury. I want to tell you a story today. It's an, it's an old uh, folk tale from Russia. And it begins with porcupine trying to go along and he meets up with rabbit. And rabbit and porcupine began to talk and porcupine asks rabbit, where, where are you going? And rabbit said, well, I'm going home. Porcupine said, really? Well, well where is home? Oh, it's a long way from here. It, it's over a river and uh, through the forest and, and through a swamp and up on a high mountain. And Porcupine said, well, I've always heard that if you take a friend along, it will shorten the journey. Rabbit said, I'd like that. And so off they go. The two friends on a journey. Well, they haven't gone far before they come around a bend in the trail and they both trip over a stick, just wham, flat on their faces. They get up, uh, dusting themselves off. Rabbit takes the stick, he's about to throw it away. And, and Porcupine said, wait, wait, what, what are you doing? And he said, I'm getting rid of this stick. It, it tripped us. And he said, yeah, no, no, uh, let me look at it. And he goes, why do you want to look at this? Well, it, it, it might be a magic life-saving stick. Oh, don't be ridiculous. It fell off that tree right there. You can see where it broke off. It fell down. It tripped us. I'd like to see. Fine, suit yourself. Porcupine checked it out and said, I think I better keep it. I can't quite tell, but it might be a magic life-saving stick. Suit yourself. And so off they went. Rabbit hopping along, porcupine with his new stick. They came to the river. Now, you may, we would call it a creek, but you've got to remember these were small creatures. It looked like a river to them. And Porcupine said, well, how are we gonna get across this? And Rabbit said, it's really quite easy. Uh, watch, and Rabbit backed up and went hop, 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 and hop to the other side. And Porcupine said, wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm not built like you. I, I can't jump like that. Well, I've enjoyed traveling with you, but I'm gonna go home. Well, wait, wait, Porcupine said, let me think. And he took the stick and hefted it in his paws and he backed up and he ran as fast as he could and he stuck the stick in the creek and pole vaulted to the other side. Rabbit said, that's amazing. He said, that really is a magic stick. I told you. Well, they went a little farther and, and they came to the forest. The underbrush was grown over, it was so thick. And, and, and Rabbit said, I, I came through here, but I don't see the path anymore. How will we get through? Porcupine said, I've got an idea. And he took the stick and pushed it into the bushes and pushed it aside. See, right there, th there's where we can go. Look, over that way. Back and forth, they went along till they came to a little glen. And as they came out in the open, they saw Wolf. And Wolf saw the two creatures and said, lunch? Well, Porcupine got down and balled up and put all of his quills out. Wolf went, 
and he put his paw on Rabbit. And Rabbit said, help, I'm, I'm gonna be his lunch. Porcupine got up, he took the stick, and he hit Wolf across the tail with it. Reet, 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 reet. Porcupine said, come on, he's probably got brothers, let's get out of here. And so they got through the forest. Well, then they came to the swamp. And it was, it was a mess trying to get through. And, and, and so Porcupine began to use the stick to figure out where the hard places were and where the wet places were to avoid. Rabbit said, oh, that's gonna to take too much time. I, I'll just meet you on the other side. And off he went. Hop, 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 splash. Help, help, I'm drowning. And Porcupine got over it as he was going into the last time, used the stick and reached out and pulled him out of the water. Ah, oh, Rabbit said, I, I can't believe it. That really is a magic life-saving stick. I told you. Well, then they got to the mountain. And the mountain was up, and they both were exhausted. And Rabbit said, we'll never make it now. He said, wait a minute. And he took the stick, and he said, you hold on to that end. I'll hold on to this end. When you get tired, I'll pull you along. When I get tired, you pull me along. We'll help each other over the rough spots. And so side by side, up they went, all the way to the top of the mountain. They made it over to Rabbit's home, a large oak with a burrow underneath it. And Rabbit said, I'm home. And all the rabbit children came out, and they came out, and they came out. I mean, he was a rabbit, a lot of children. And, and he came out, and Mrs. Rabbit said, where have you been? Actually, those are the words she said, but that was not the tone of voice she used. It was much closer to, where have you been? And, and he said, oh, oh, and he told all of their adventures and he said, we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Porcupine's magic life-saving stick. And Mrs. Rabbit said, uh, with so many children, I wish I had a magic life-saving stick. And Porcupine said, well, here, you can have this one. And she said, no, no, I, I can't take your magic life-saving stick. He said, oh, it's okay. Uh, uh, you just take this one, I'll, I'll get another one. And she said, how will you find it? Uh, uh, and he said, well, I'll, I'll just get another stick. And she said, yeah, but what if it's not a magic life-saving stick? And he said, oh, it doesn't matter. Any stick will do. The magic's not here. The magic is here and here. And I like this story. I like this story because Rabbit thinks he can get along just fine but I like this story because for me, that's how we live. It's with the heart and mind of Jesus. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he throws another hard one in there and says, oh yeah, and love your enemies too. But you see, love is not just a matter of the heart. We have to decide to love people. We have to choose to follow God and follow God's commandments who tell us how to love, tell us to love as God loves in Jesus. And so, you see, many people spend their lives looking for a magic life-saving stick. For the thing that's gonna be just right to fill that hole in their lives, to, to, to make things happen. But that's not how it happens. It happens when we choose to follow Jesus with our hearts and with our minds. And then we have life.
stay connected to God? How do, we, how do we acquire that heart and mind of Jesus? And I think there are, there are three things that, that help me stay connected. One is, is staying connected to the greatness of God. And in this setting, I, I think about Psalm 121, where it says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and you're coming in from this time on and forevermore. Now, do you hear that? He's, the psalmist is staying connected to the greatness of God, that, that God creates all this, uh, all of the universe. But, but when I seek help, do I look to the hills, he says? Do I look to the mountains? No, I look to God. I look beyond all these wonderful things that God has created to get closer. And then the psalmist says, my strength is in God, not all these other things, who made the mountains. My help is from God who never rests. My help comes from God who watches me as I go out and as I come in, wherever I go. And so we stay connected to the greatness of God. But another way that I stay connected is, is thinking about the goodness of God. And, and again, I go to the Psalms, one that you're probably very familiar with. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Another translation says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That God's goodness is with us each and every day in the valley, throughout our valley shadow dark moments. But also, I love that beginning where God feeds the sheep and protects them, brings them to green pastures, and finds still waters. So another way that we stay connected to God is when we rely on the goodness of God. And then a third way is to live in the presence of God. And again, let's go back to the 23rd Psalm where it continues and says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, we're not in the valley alone. One of the names that is attached to Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So we stay connected to God when we live in God's presence. In the Old Testament, there's a, an old story that comes 
many years after Joshua, after King David, after Solomon, and Israel is being threatened by large armies. And King Jehoshaphat goes to the temple and prayed before God. And yet he, Jehoshaphat, remembered the lessons of Joshua. The one who said, God, I got this. I, I, I can handle this on my own. And then things didn't go well. Joseph Josephat remembered that. And uh, you read this passage, it's from 2 Chronicles 20, 12. And it says, I do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you, O God. And then a prophet came to Jehoshaphat and said, listen, Judah, listen, inhabitants of, of Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed at this great multitude, this big army. For the battle is not yours alone, but God's. The battle is not yours alone, but God's. And so with that, with that word, with that news, Jehoshaphat brings some singers in. Not archers, not uh, people throwing spears, not the cavalry. No, he brings singers in. And he sends them in front of his army, in front of the people, and they sang, Give thanks to the Lord. God's steadfast love endures forever. So, let's go back a minute to that first story with Joshua, who struggles because... He doesn't check in with God. He doesn't stay connected to God. He doesn't stay connected to God's greatness or God's goodness or even in God's presence. And as an old man, Joshua gathered the people together one more time. And Joshua brought them to Shechem, which is in the valley between two high mountains. And in that valley, Joshua reminded them of their journey. He reminded them of how God, the creator of the universe, had led them and stayed with them through thick and thin, through day and night. And just like his mentor and leader Moses had done when he was departing, Joshua confronted the people with the same choice. And it says in Joshua 24, 15, Now if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The choice is yours choice is mine. I urge you, choose life. See?